Are you familiar with Book Bub? Okay. Book and then B U B, all one word. There's another one called Book Blast, which is again all one word. Well, when when my when the book first came out, despite all of my you know pimping it right and left all over the place, uh, the sales were still kind of you know they weren't what I hoped they would be. And I talked to the head of digital at Random House, and he said, "Just wait. We have we have things that we can do." One of these was this BookBob newsletter, and if you have uh, if your book's available electronically, you can you can pay to be part of BookBob. And every week, a newsletter goes out, and it has discounted eBooks. Okay, and my this my my book sells for two ninety nine, which by the way. All the marketing, all the marketing people in digital publishing, $2.99 is the sweet spot if it's a novel. Not $0.99, cents, not $1.99. $1.99 sells terribly. And they're not sure why. It could be that it's not, it doesn't seem like it's quite enough value, but it's just on the edge of being too much for someone that just wants to spend a dollar or something like that. Whatever reason. $2.99 is where it's at for a novel. So that's another thing I learned. And I wouldn't have known had it not been uh, for these very smart people in publishing. So they knocked the price down to 99 cents. It went out in the BookBub newsletter. And the nice thing about the BookBub newsletter is if you're into mysteries and if you're into uh, you know, historical fiction, you select the kind of things that you like. And that's what you get. You're not getting stuff that you don't like. Well, immediately. The book starts shooting up Amazon's charts, Barnes and Noble's charts. Apple doesn't have charts, but it was doing really well there too. So then, if you've ever experienced this, you're on the roller coaster ride of watching your, your numbers on Amazon. And I just refer my wife's calling me, my friends are calling me, you're right next to Stephen King, you know? And 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 yes, I was right next to Stephen King for like the one time in my life. I'm going to be next to Stephen King at a bestseller list, and it just went up, up, up. It cracked the top 10 in horror. It cracked the Kindle top 100 um, for a little while, you know. And of course, every minute of that, I'm taking screenshots and posting the screenshots on Facebook in case people don't believe me. And uh, you know, it's it's a thrilling ride, and it's all because of that newsletter. So there, the, 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 the traditional publishers have some secrets, and I just told you one of the secrets. So hopefully that's worth all my other blathering coming out to get that. Um, so it really was exciting. And it, uh, it went, it, I think it almost cracked, it cracked the top 25 in Barnes and Noble. And it's thrilling, you know, it's thrilling to see something you've worked so long and hard on getting in the, in the hands of so many readers. So the first thing I started looking for is reviews, right? Well, I go on Goodreads, and I, I wish I would have brought it because this, there's a review, and a lot of times when I do readings, I'll read this review. It was the very first review I saw. I was like, have you ever read something that made red bloody spots dance in front of your eyes that you wanted to throw the book across the floor? I wanted to take a shotgun and shoot the main character in the face for wasting that much of my life, and it just went on and on and on and on and on. And I was, I was devastated. I'm like, this is the very first review on Goodreads. This is someone who got an ARC from NetGalley, so they had taken the time to read it. It's like, never have I wished there was a rating system with negative stars more than after having read this book. And it was, it was about 10 paragraphs basically saying that I should be you know, taken from the, from the planet, shot into the sun, and things like that. But again, you know, nowadays, I read that review because it's, it's really funny and, p and people enjoy the, the viciousness of it. So I, I learned very quickly that you, you know, a thick skin is important and especially when it comes to reviews online because people just love to rip things to shreds and rip people to shreds. But then some better reviews started coming out. I got blurbs from some really great writers came in um, and a couple more have come in recently. So, so you know, it's and then things just slowly started to, to, to work better. And I guess my editor saw the sales that were doing pretty well, and she said, we'd like to offer you um, two, two more books. And especially since this one's pretty open-ended, have you ever envisioned it as a series? I said, yeah. 
that's why I left it open-ended, you know, I mean, that's, that's what I've been thinking. It, it really lead, you know, it lends itself to being a series. So um, at that point, for the first time ever, I had to outline something before writing it. And I'm a non-outliner, you know, I'm a seat of the pantser, you know, we, we call ourselves, because we don't like to outline. But I learned to, to actually enjoy the process of outlining, first of all, because I needed to do it. And it forced me to sort of think through the story in advance, and I found out I'm not really an anti-outliner at all. I, I, outlining's okay, and especially if you're on a deadline, and you have an editor who wants to see something before they commit to it. So she read it, loved it. So I have two more books coming. The sequel is coming out this October. So if you do get this and read it, um, you know, you don't have a whole lot of wait for the second book. And the third book will conclude the trilogy and I've got some other things kind of happening too. Um, but let me tell you one other thing. And this, sometimes it's the, the, the things you don't expect that will work the best in your favor for marketing and sales. Okay, I, I also write nonfiction, and I was watching, does anyone watch um, the HBO show True Detective? Anyone see that by chance? Did see that? Yeah. Well, it's kind of, it's, it's very similar thematically to this, it's very dark, uh, it's, it's kind of a rural setting, so I, I immediately clicked with the show. And then uh, the third episode of the show, I'm watching it, and one of the characters is reading from the diary of a woman who was murdered, who was found dead, and she, she kept the diary. And she starts talking about the king in yellow and a place called Carcosa. And I, I sat up as I'm watching. I mean, it was like, you know, the hair is standing up my arms because that, there's a book. It's written by a guy named Robert W. Chambers of short stories. It was written in 1890 or 1895. I have to double check that. Called The King in Yellow. And it's a book of short stories, and three of them are kind of supernatural, weird, and they later influenced H.P. Lovecraft a lot. He incorporated a lot of what Chambers wrote into his, his fiction. But what The King in Yellow is about, it's about a play that anyone who reads it, even a few words, goes completely insane. It's a corrupt text. And this was written at a time where like, Oscar Wilde was being prosecuted for you know, writing you know, sexual stuff and all that. But this, this thing called the king in yellow, and there's, there's a, a king in yellow who's never really shown, but he's like a malign influence. And he comes from this land called Carcosa. So, I, I, you know, I'm jumping up and down that this weird little, you know, passion of mine happens to be in this show, which is getting great ratings and a lot of attention. So I thought, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll write about this. I'll pitch an article somewhere, you know, some, some of them. So I pitched it to Salon, pitched it to Slate, you know, pitched it a whole bunch of places where I thought it might fit. Nobody wanted it. And finally I sent it to a site called io9, which is like a science, science fiction website. And uh, the editor read it. She said, eh, that sounds, sounds interesting. Yeah, it might, it might get some interest. Sure, but we can only pay you 50 bucks. And I said, I don't care. You know, it's, it's something I like. It's kind of a niche subjects and maybe it'll get some attention. Well, they put this article up and within about 20 minutes it was the most read article on that site. In two days it was eclipsing, eclipsing every other article on the site. Enormously. I mean, I would, at one point I would sit and I would click my browser and click it again and it would go up by 1,000 views. They show how many people have viewed it right there on the website. So, you know, if I thought watching my Amazon ratings go up, I mean, this, this was even more of like a, a crack hit, you know? I mean, it, you know, I was like one of those rats in the study that keeps pressing the thing until they die. Well, and it kept going up. As a matter of fact, I checked it. Um, I did a talk for the Carroll County MWA, and the day I checked it, it had, it had gone over a million page views. IO9. It's called the one literary reference you need to. You can Google Michael Hughes, True Detective, and it, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Also on my website, I keep a list of stuff I've read in there. So the nice thing about this, IO9 put a little cover of my book with a link to it. And I could watch, and they have the number of people that bought it through that link built into their site. 
So I think I sold around 600 books just from this one article. And that article got my name out there where I could never have gotten it just from the book. I had radio station, late night radio station in Chicago call me up. We want you to be, our, our producer loves this show. Our, our, our on air guy loves it and he wants you to come and talk about it. So, you know, three in the morning on the East Coast, I'm on the phone on a work night, you know, uh, it, it became a full time job really to deal with this. I was getting calls at work that I had to take from, you know, a producer in New York. I, I was on the radio in Canada. I was on Hulu TV for a pilot they were producing. I mean, it just would not stop. And it's a matter of hitting the right thing. I was just lucky. I mean, most of it was just luck. I just happened. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it was, it, it was so, so always think, you know, that even your writing that's not related to what you're really passionate about can wind up doing wonders for you. And uh, so anyway, I have the, the sequel is called Witch Lights. It's coming out in October. Again, unfortunately, it's only digitally. Um, however, I just found out recently that it sold, Random House sold the German rights, and it's coming out in the paperback. I can't produce the paper, the title, but it's act, so I will have a copy of my book in a language that I can't read, you know. <laughs> um, but the, the title translates to something like Covenant of Darkness, which I like, that's pretty cool. I like that title too, you know. So that's another thing where a traditional publisher they just did that. I mean, they, they just called me up and said, hey, um, you know, we, we our, one of our rights agents uh, is selling German rights. If you want, should we go ahead with it? I'm like, yeah, of course, go ahead with it, you know? And that's just like easy money. You know, it's not a lot of money, but that's just like free money that kind of comes in and drops in on you. So, so uh, that's the story. I mean, I hope it's kind of, kind of helpful in your own, you know, your own path and, uh, and now I'll, I'll take any questions anybody might have. Yes? Is there some reason why your publisher can't do a print on demand version? Yeah, you know, it's written in the contract that they, they, they have the right to, rights to do that. So, you know, that's part of what they have. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they're waiting for it to hit a specific sales figure where they think it, then it might translate into. They, I don't know if they're waiting till all three of the digital books are done, and then maybe they'll they'll see how that's progressed, and maybe do it then. I don't know, and they're not really too forthcoming about why. I think part of it is they're really committed. They have other imprints too. There's a Hydra is for um, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. So if that's what you write, um, go to the Hydra website, and you can submit your manuscript. That the same editor who's my editor will wind up reading it. Um, they have uh, an imp a digital imprint called Alibi, which is for crime and detective fiction. They have one called Love Swept, which is uh, romance. And uh, I think there's one other one too. I'm kind of blanking on right now. So I think they really want to make this work. And they want to show the digital only is, is a, you know, maybe. Again, I'm, I'm kind of speculating because they're, they're not. They said we, 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 we might do a, a print version, but they weren't inter interested in doing print on demand or anything like that. I don't know if it's their economics or, or whatever. So. Anybody else? Yeah. Why is it that you think that you've seen a digital publishing people and the ability to sample, uh, getting, get a 10% sample? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, that is right. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, so I'm going to look out there and I sell public. Okay. And on Smashwords, mm -hmm. you can see the statistics of sales and also downloads and also sales. Yeah. And you can see, well, okay, there's been 400 downloads of samples and 100 sales. Right. Does that mean something to the editing, right? Make sure that we catch them in that first 10%? Yeah, that, do you have any statistics on your book like that? I don't have the statistics on how many samples have been downloaded. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's a lot more than have actually bought the book. Yeah, but I do think that, um, again, going back to the, the Borderlands uh, boot camp, one of the in really instructive things they do, and I've done them when I've been in workshops and taught workshops, things like that, is they take 
and I'm usually the one that does this because I go back and help them out with this with this boot camp, which again I really recommend. It, 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 I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't gone there. Well, they, they pass out the first like five or ten pages of everyone's manuscript, and I get them all, and I don't identify who it is, but one by one I'll, I'll read them. I'll start reading from the very beginning. And the exercise is, it, the other people sitting out there, as soon as you would stop reading, you put up your hand. Okay, it's, it's, to, it's to simulate someone who's in a bookstore. They call it the bookstore browser exercise. It's to simulate someone who's walking along, picks up your book, or in this case, download a sample and you're, you know, whatever. And it is an amazing exercise and it really makes you think, what am I doing? on those first few pages, or the first page. And, and it, it's, it, it's an appalling exercise for a lot of people because they find out you have to throw away the first three or four pages that you've sweated and worked so much on because it's junk. It's not where the story starts. The story starts, and try this with your novel. I mean, it, it completely works for me. I still wind up eventually throwing away the first couple of pages because you're spinning your wheels. And then finally something, there'll be a sentence or a paragraph that just hits and you go, that's, that's where the story starts. It's really, so that it is very critical, I think, especially when you're publishing digitally, that you, you grab them. And it doesn't have to be Joe pulled the knife out of his friend's forehead, you know, or something like that. But, but it has to be engaging, it has to be compelling, and you have to get them right then. Yes? You mentioned that you also do not Mm-hmm. Is for nonfiction? Let us say for nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, well, nonfiction is difficult um, for me to say because most of my, you know, most of my work has been fiction. But the nonfiction I found, uh, what's worked for me, and it's only has worked for me, is just to to pitch as widely as you can to places that will publish it because you want to have some credits. And of course, you know, to get it, sometimes to get something published, you need credits. It's that catch-22 sort of thing. But you know, even this, just this io9 article now, like people, you know, people have read it. You know, people just, you go, oh, you wrote that? You know, that kind of thing. So I think it's, it's more important um, if you're trying to write nonfiction, like a book of essays or, or some, what in, is there anything in particular that you're? My copy would be too complicated. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you have to wind up holding your own hand, really, and it's um, which is the hard part about it. You know, get, groups like this are really helpful. Um, I, I there's a there's a great um, if you haven't seen it, there's a website called Agent Query. Have you seen that before? Have you used that? It's called Agent Query. Q U E R Y, and you can you can select you know little menus what you write. And, and it, will, it will give you a list of agents. And then once you have that list, you still have to like, look them up and study about them. But, but that, you know, rather than look, if it's a, even if it's a local book, I mean, you, if, if it's something really local, like you know, um, Annapolis-based or Baltimore-based, something like that, then, then there are publishers that specialize, niche publishers, things like that. If it's a little broader than that, I still think you have to you have to go through you know New York or or or, or just you know find those publishers. I wish I had some suggestions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's the, there's the university presses, you know, look there. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, the best bet is just to find, find the, you know, the editors and, and the agents that, that publish exactly what you want to publish. Yeah? Yeah. How long was it when it was to the point where you said, okay, now I'm going to send it out, when it was finally set to set? Was it like three years? Years, yeah. I think it's probably about three, maybe closer to four years. So, you know, again, I wish I had just sat down and kept writing, but I was so fixated on that, on getting this one published, that I really, I, I kind of hosed myself, really, because uh, I, if I kept it up, I'd be a better writer. For ha I'd have more things I could be sending out, and you know, may, something may have hit and gotten published before this book. But but I am very lucky too. You know, I mean, most people their first novel does not get published, so I feel extremely fortunate that I found the right people. And it also it's it's, it's it shows the value of you know I hate to use networking because it sounds like you're just trying to get something for yourself when you're networking, but just being friendly and meeting people and going to conferences and going to groups like this. Because that's where you know the unexpected things fall into place. I got one yeah, sure, sure. So you were talking about bringing up one in the industry. One of the big things that's been in the news lately has been the uh, negotiations between Amazon and Shet. Yeah. Looking into the next traditional public that mm -hmm. have those contracts or the negotiations. So, mm -hmm. are you concerned at all? What are, what are you thinking as now that you've gone through a traditional, well, somebody associated with a traditional publisher into the ebook realm, and now you have to deal with the giant? Amazon like, there's a lot of back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm conflicted because the, the majority of my sales, <laughs> the majority of my sales come from Amazon. Um, you know, to a smaller extent, Barnes and, o Barnes and Noble and Apple, and then, you know, um, you know, Kobo and stuff like that. It's really small. Amazon is where the bulk of my sales come from. And if, if, if your book comes out digitally, that's going to be where your sales come from. I also have friends that own bookstores, you know, and I can't do a reading at their bookstore. Like I can't even ask to do a reading at their bookstore because they hate Amazon with such a passion, you know, an independent bookstore. You know, Amazon is, they, it's like a giant colossal beast smashing them down. Uh, so, and also, you know, but as a writer, I'm happy that my, my work is out there. I'm happy that it's, you know, I, I, I actually like ebooks. I got the first iPad when it came out. I'm such a, like an Apple nerd. I got the, one of the very first iPads when it came out. Not the first one, but I was, you know, I, I pre-ordered and it showed up. And I love all the things that most people like about their Kindles and their, and their iPads and things. You know, going on vacation and having 10 books on the thing instead of carting around 10 books, things like that. And the ease. What's that? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, Apple, Apple got got in trouble for for trying to set. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so I'm torn. You know, I I don't like the way they're dealing with Hachette, but I also think Hachette is another mega behemoth of a company, and you know, I, I so it, it's it it's an uncomfortable thing for me um, because Amazon is where people are finding my book and where they're reading it, where they're rating it and giving it four stars, you know, whatever. Um, at the same time, I see bookstores vanishing, you know, I mean, Barnes and Nobles basically hanging on by a thread now. Uh, I, don't, I don't want Amazon to be the only way I can get books. I still like bookstores. I still support bookstores. Um, so this thing with them, I, I'm not sure. I know a lot of my, my writer friends are in the same position. Like they feel really conflicted. They don't like Amazon's tactics, uh, but, but they, they realize that that's how a lot of their books sell. There are people that don't, aren't lucky enough to live in Annapolis or Baltimore or Savannah Park or whatever, where you can't just go to a bookstore and find, especially if you like, you know, kind of hard to find books. So yeah. I. It's, I, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I know Hachette is the first one that's renegotiating their terms. So the other Random House and all, all the others are kind of, you know, kind of waiting to see what happens here. So uh, your guess is as good as mine at this point. Yeah. Have you yeah. presented yourself as a writer yet for taxes? And, uh, taxes? And to, to not your room where you do your 
writing and that kind of thing and have your process for yeah, what I do, I mean, you know, I, I'm not making a ton, you know, I, I have my day job, thank God. You know, if I was being paid for my writing, I'd be under an overpass probably right now. Um, but it's, what I do is when the, when the checks come in, which with, it's the other thing about traditional publishing that you, I mean, you, you shouldn't even think about when the payment's coming. It'll eventually show up. Um, but I just, I, I just realized that half of that is, 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 not mine anymore. So I really try to throw it in a, you know, uh, yeah, no, I just throw it in my bank account and I, you know, w like I'm going to a conference tomorrow. Well, that's, that's a tax write off, you know. Oh, I'm going to be writing about Western Maryland. Well, if I go to Western Maryland, you know, it's a tax write off. So, you know, the IRS may watch this. I'm, I'm really very, very, <laughs> very good about staying legal with my taxes. But you have to be, you know, creative and make sure you take advantage of of what you can legally. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all it's all pretty. Yeah. Right. What happens though is like if you're if you're writing articles and stuff like I do too, that's then you get this pile of things and um, luckily Yeah, luckily my wife is a very good, you know, accountant minded person because I'm not up to me, I don't know what would happen, but yeah, yes. Yeah, I always hate to answer the last question, but you mentioned you have a day job, mm -hmm. you have a wife, and you have one child. Two, uh, okay. two little kids, two daughters. Well, how do you, how do you work in your writing? How do you, how do you, how do you shut up and go to the that? See the bags under my eyes right there? No, see, really, I, I don't sleep very much. Um, when I, I also tend to write in bursts. I'm not a, I would love to stand up here and say I write every day, you know, and get my X number of words, but I don't. I write, I write in bursts. And uh, I finished up the last uh, draft of Witch Lights, my next book, in about six weeks or so. And what I do is to put the kids to bed, I go down to the basement where we have a little pet rabbit. He's my sole companion, which is a good, good pet to have if you're a writer because they're quiet and they just kind of sit there and they don't do a whole lot. And I just, I, I, I write a few hours a night after the kids are gone to bed and, uh, you know, I just suck it up. I mean, this, this is what I want to do and I also want to have a family. I also want to be a good dad and a good husband and all that. So my, my window for writing is limited. Uh, you know, I'll, sometimes I'll write during my lunch break. Um, you know, weekends I, I get a few more hours in usually because I stay up a little bit later. But, you know, if it's something you really want to do, you're just going to do it. You're going to make the time to do it. And we've all heard the stories of, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald, you know, sitting, you know, working on a wheelbarrow or something, you know, something like that. And that's, that, that's, that's really what you have to do. I'd love to be able to write and not have a day job, but um, that's not happening anytime soon. It's harder and harder. The, the writers I know who could do it are a shrinking number. Uh, yes? Uh, first of all, thanks for really in, in oh, thank you. presentation. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you had some blurbs from, you said, for some mm -hmm. serious writers. Are yeah. How, how did those come about from your, your publisher working that or did yeah. you work that? Or? It's a combination of both. Um, that's, that's another advantage to having a traditional publisher. They've got someone who's sitting there who's ready to send out a galley. And it's watermarked, so you know, they don't want people just sending this around. Um, had F. Paul Wilson, uh, who's, a, who's a superb writer, best, many, many, many bestsellers. He gave me a great blurb. But part of the reason he did that is because he knew me. He knew me from a conference called Nikon which is a Northeast um, Writers Conference, which is a conference that one of the original people at this conference was Stephen King. Until he got so famous, he couldn't go back anymore. Um, but it's a, it's a great conference, it's very small, it's mostly geared towards dark fantasy, horror, stuff like that. Um, but I'm, I knew Paul, I just met him, had a couple beers with him. He taught at the Borderlands Boot Camp. So, you know, that's, that's the other thing I learned, and I've, I've watched people hurt themselves by being jerks, you know, or by, or by acting in selfishly or getting, you know, getting upset at someone else's success and people can, can tell that. And, you know, I just, 
if I do anything else among other writers, I just try to be friendly and decent and share what, because other people have helped me so much, so I try to do that in return. And Paul, you know, if, if he hadn't known me on a personal level, he might not have, I just, I got on Facebook and said, hey, Paul, um, my publisher's sending out, you know, and he said, yeah, sure, I'll read it. I didn't know if he was really going to read it. I mean, he's a friend, but yeah. you never know with these sort of things. And he read it, and he got back to me with, like, a fantastic blurb, which you could see if you, if you look up the book on Amazon or, or uh, anywhere else, really, on my website, you know, it's got his blurb on there. And that's, that's what they did. They just, they, they took people I knew, but they also sent it to people I didn't know. Uh, Scott Nicholson, Tim Levin, um, so, it, so my blurbs came from people they, they knew, for whatever reason, these people owe them a favor, you know, I don't know, for whatever reason, they sent it out. And one of the guys who gave me a great blurb, he goes, I don't really read the whole thing. <laughs> so, but he gave me a great blurb, you know, and, and he said, I liked what I read, it was really great and spooky, but I just, I had my own deadline, so I couldn't finish it. But yeah, sure, I was happy to give it to you. So an, another good reason why First of all, be, not being a jerk is going to pay off in the long run. And also making friends on the larger writer community. Really helpful. Yes? And so your agent, Mark? Matt. Matt. So did Matt pick you up that second time and actually ask to read it because Tom had said? Exactly. That's the only way. That's the only way. And that's why I said, Tom, he, I queried him. He said no. He, ah. Yeah. yeah, he said, just tell him I, I, I'm, tell him I sent, tell, told you to send it to him. So again, you know, that, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful because a lot of people are much better writers than me and, and things just don't line up or don't happen. So I'm like grateful to the gods or fate or, you know, sheer happenstance or whatever it is. But I also think it's, it's really lesson number one for me was just, just talking to people and getting out there and not just trying, hey, I got this book, you know, you want to read it? It's really cool. You like the people on Facebook or Twitter that that's all they do. You know, that, that's alienating. No one wants to befriend your book. They, if you're friendly and interesting, then they'll befriend you. And if you're helpful, if you help people, then in turn, they'll, they'll help you when they have a chance to do it. And that's what really helped. Yeah, well, then you have to be creative about that, too. Um, my, ne my next book is being released in October at Comic-Con, New York City, which is big. So, uh, yeah, so, but, but what I've done, I, I, I just talk, um, I've done readings in, um, I did a reading in a house that was allegedly haunted, you know, so I just try to look for, like, creative places to go. Uh, mm hmm Yeah, Random House did not, uh, the, guy, the guy whose novel was published after mine, they did a trailer for him and it was, it was really nice. You can do it with yourself. Yeah. You talk and yeah, yeah. That's true. I mean, you know, anything you can do, other talks I've done on other subjects, I talk on weird stuff like UFOs and unexplained stuff and all that, which is, you know, kind of why I write this stuff. You know, it's, it's an opportunity to talk, and, and, and you mention your book at the end. You know, you, you don't want to seem like you're a walking you know, billboard for your book, but if you're talking about something else somewhere, then throw that in too, yeah. I haven't wanted to do a trailer myself. I, I even do film production, so I'm really picky about trailers, so, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, well, you know, maybe the next book, we'll see. I'll, I'll push Random House to do it the next time, so. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't that long. Probably about eight years. Uh, yeah. Before I was friends. Yeah. Friends about six years ago. Yeah. Yeah. He was great. He was excellent. I, I recommended. I told him about MWA and said you should talk there. Yeah. <laughs> And just say to everybody else, you know, when he, if he comes back and does something again, you can say, oh, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, he's I, yeah, he's very approachable. And again, he, he gave me my lucky break, yes. you know, so I, I'm, 
so grateful to him. It's, it goes without saying. What's that? His name opens doors. It does. Yeah, it really does. It really does. Because he's a likable guy, because he helps. He believes in paying forward and helping others get where he's gotten and all that stuff. If there are any more questions, thanks. I, it's, it's, it's great to see a good group. Um, and I, lo I love being down in Annapolis every chance I can get. So thank you for coming out.